Right, so last week we were looking at the mercy of God in the Old Testament. And whilst the mercy of God there is often downplayed by Christians, it was only the merciful patience of the Lord which pres preserved human life from the time of the fall in the Garden of Eden until the coming of Jesus. Having said that, but there's lots of the mercy of God in the Old Testament, no matter how powerfully God's mercy was expressed in his saving acts for Israel and the law and the ceremonial rituals, it's only in the humanity of Jesus that divine mercy takes on a definite, permanent and unsurpassable form. That is, the mercy of God really is concentrated and crystallised in Christ. The coming of God in human flesh means the Creator and Judge has shared the depths and sharpness of our need for mercy. Now, here, here we have a bit of a problem. It's Jesus saw things more clearly than we do. Having lived all our lives immersed in misery, I have more to say about that later, our true need for mercy is easily overlooked. I was reading an article about mental health in Australia the other day, and the author remarked, um, and she, she had some stat statistics about women, uh, that anxiety disorders are the leading cause of death in females, between 5 and 44. One in five women in their 30s and 40s are alcohol dependent. Women between 30 and 50 are four times more likely to die of an accidental overdose than in a road accident, but you won't hear that talked about. And one in five Australians experience a mental illness in any one year. For men, one in eight will experience serious depression during life, one in five, serious anxiety. One in seven, depression or anxiety in every, any given year. Human life is ravaged by misery and we really do need God's mercy. There are deeper dimensions to this I'll talk about later. In Jesus, and only in Jesus, is God's heart of mercy fully exposed. The mercy of God is not kindness for kindness sake, you know, as though God needed to feel good about himself by showing mercy. He doesn't need to do that. The goodness of God and his mercy involves a plan whereby his own life will penetrate inside the power of sin and evil to, to, that brings about mercy. And through atoning suffering, he will deliver us from the guilt that oppresses us. The work of God in Christ takes hold of a world deprived through sin of the full glory of its being and restores it far beyond where it could ever else be. So what we're saying is, you know, when the Bible says all have sinned and fell, fall short of the glory of God, we're all born into a world and into a human experience which is far less than God intended. And only Jesus can not only take us back to where we were meant to be, but far beyond that in his glory. Right, from the very beginning, the coming of Jesus is announced as a mercy. First in the Song of Mary, and this material is in Luke 1. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And then in the prophecy of Zechariah that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of sins. You know, remember we last week, you know, forgiveness is very attached to this uh, subject of mercy. Because of the tender mercy of our God. Now this translation, tender mercy, is a good translation. And there's another one that's like it. Heartfelt mercies. For the mercy that God reveals in Christ comes from the deepest recesses of his being where he's moved or affected by our wretchedness. Now sometimes we, um, we're not like that. We see wretchedness and we're not moved. But God has always moved. The mercy 
from God that goes out to save wasn't restricted to the people of Israel, like in those passages, but extended to all the nations. And Paul explains this was at the heart of his own missionary zeal when he says in Romans 15, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to conform the promises given to the patri patriarchs in order that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, might glorify God for his mercy. And you find that in the book of Acts. When, when people who are not Jewish people come to Jesus as the Saviour, they glorify God for his mercy. Would there be more of it? In the coming of Jesus, God sets himself on the side of suffering people. In his merciful and assertive actions of teaching and healing, Christ sided with fragile, fallen human beings in a war. Jesus was always in a war, a spiritual one. In a war against the entrenched forces of evil, and much of which we brought on ourselves. Now, I don't think we understand this very well, so I came up with a couple of, you know, uh, questions about mercy. Since the federal elections, which was not long ago, there have been 31, 31 or 21, 31 reported suicide attempts amongst the asylum seekers on Manus Island. Now, what does that mean to God? I'm not, you know, asking for a political decision here, but all these, they're all men, trying to kill themselves. What does that mean to the mercy of God? Oh, something else that's been in the news, uh, these women that went from various countries because they had some infatuation, they wanted to be married to an ISIS terrorist in Syria, an Islamic State terrorist. They got married, had kids, the husbands are probably dead, now they want to go home. And most people are saying about these women, she made her bed, let her lie in it. Now, is that a sentiment that Jesus has in his heart? These are not easy questions, but God is merciful. And Jesus is perfectly sympathetic or empathetic with human sufferings. And in that feeling that you see in Jesus in the Gospels for suffering, there came a new and deeper revelation. Something new and deeper which challenges all popular understanding of God. All popular understanding of God. One, one theologian says about Jesus, he was great not because he was above feelings, but because he could feel as no one else could feel. Now some of us might have had these experiences, overwhelming experiences of the, of the compassion of God, the mercy of God, the love of God for suffering people. Now, Jesus never brought mercy by accusing people, like the woman caught in adultery or other various sinners, but he brought mercy by shouldering weakness upon himself. Now, disciples thought they, that they knew a thing or two. So when they all came across a man that had been born blind, they said, this is in John chapter 9, they said, because they thought they were experts about evil and sin, they said, um, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? He somehow had to sin, him or his parents. But Jesus said, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And what did Jesus do? I said, what did he always do? Heal the man. He wasn't looking for a cause. He healed the man. Now, the man certainly was a sinner, as was his parents. But that wasn't the point. Okay? Jesus, mercy moved him in the power of the Spirit to heal. So when we go through the Gospels, like our Luke readings, the tender mercies of God manifest in the soft-heartedness of Jesus drew forth from the miserable <coughs> pleas for mercy. Right? When Jesus was around, people started to cry out for mercy. So, uh, in Matthew, a pagan mother, that's the Syrophoenician woman, comes 
crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And what does Jesus do? He gets rid of the demon. A distressed father, which is in Matthew 17, says, Lord, have mercy on my son. Have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. So what does Jesus do? Brings liberation and healing. A blind beggar, you know, blind Bartimaeus, they couldn't restrain him. He began to cry out. This is a bit of a, you know, theme, isn't it? He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But what did he do? He cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And what did Jesus do? He held his sight. It just happens all the time in the Gospels. Now all these healings fulfill some of the Old Testament prophecies we looked at last week. That there would be a day when pleas for mercy would come before God and he would hear and cleanse. When Jesus told the parable of the tax collector who, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, sometimes I feel like a sinner. Um, I'm not a sinner by nature, right? Well, I'm by regenerated nature, I'm not a child of God. But I don't feel a, sin a sinner under the hands of God often enough. Because when I do, under the hands of God, that's not under the hands of my conscience or someone else's accusation. And I cry out to God for mercy, what's going to happen? You're going to get mercy and forgiveness and cleansing and freedom and liberation in Christ. So this chap in this parable said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And in Jesus' parable, that man, not the Pharisee, went home justified. And Jesus was seeing this happen, that, that sinners were coming into the righteousness of God, into the forgiveness of God and the peace of God in his own ministry. <clears throat> so what did Jesus teach? Well, the teaching of Jesus about mercy was itself a mercy. Do you understand that? That he taught on mercy was a sign of God's mercy. So he said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall what? Obtain mercy. They shall, yeah, obtain mercy. The merciful shall receive mercy. You want mercy? Be merciful. And Jesus said in another place, in Luke chapter 6, He says, Love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Well, this is a bit different from our capitalist culture, isn't it? Expect nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Have you noticed that? I mean, that's part of the reason why this country is so blind to the things of God, because God has been so kind to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Now, if you want to be like God, Jesus didn't say, be powerful. Jesus didn't say, be knowledgeable. These are sort of things we admire. If you want to be like God, be what? Merciful. Merciful. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? Now Jesus was extolling the Father as merciful. And, and when he did that, it reminds me of a story in the, the life of Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, remember, was the great 19th century preacher. But he had a lot of illness. He actually had illness pretty much all his life, which they treat, know how to treat now, but um, he used to take time off every year and go to the south of France because he wasn't well. Anyway, this is his story, this is his words. He says, When I was racked with pain to an extreme degree so that I could no longer bear it without crying out, I asked everyone to go from the room and leave me alone. And then I had nothing I could say to God but this. You are my father and I am your child. 
And you as a father, you knew how to use the Bible with God. <laughs> and you as a father are tender and full of mercy. I could not bear to see my child suffer and you make me suffer and if I saw my child tormented as I am now I would do what I could to help him or her and put my arms under him or her to sustain them. Will you hide your face from me, my father? That's how you pray. Pray like Jesus prayed. Pray scripture. Will you still lay on a heavy hand and not give me a smile from your face? So I pleaded. And I ventured to say when I was quiet and they came back into the room he said I shall never have such pain again from this moment for God has heard my prayer. Now he didn't, he didn't pretend he didn't have any problems. You know, a lot of Christian leaders, a lot of Christians they sort of pretend they don't have any problems. Well that's one of their problems, perhaps the biggest problem they've got. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He says, I bless God that ease came, the racking pain never returned. That's the mercy of our Father. Uh, there are many stories like that, actually. Do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? The Samaritan comes upon someone and, you know, they've been beaten up by the side of the road, and the priest has been passed, Levite's been passed, went on the other side. So Jesus said to the legal expert who'd asked about who's the neighbour, Jesus said, which of these three do you think, you know, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, which of these three proved to be a neighbour to the man who fell among the robbers? And the legal ex expert said, um, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. It was clear enough. Christ spoke God's word to the self-righteous religious leaders. He reminded them from the Old Testament that God said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Mm. You know, people can come to church and give money. But sometimes it doesn't really cost them anything. Mm. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And he said in another place, he said, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. So, around Jesus, you found the humble and desperate flocking around him. They were there to receive God's mercy. But the arrogant and self sufficient, they don't want to be around Jesus. They didn't think they needed the mercy of God. Has anything changed? Nothing's changed. Would that the Lord bring us more people who know their need, their misery, and that we would see Jesus' mercy help them. Well, there's a parable I'll look at in a couple of weeks, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Remember this story? There was this guy that had this huge <coughs> debt owed to his master. Impossible. It's possibly big, actually. Um, and he was released from that debt. And then he came across a, a fellow servant that owed him a few cents. And he wouldn't let that guy go. And then to the conclusion of this parable, Jesus said, Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. And his anger, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And it was so big as impossible to pay, right? So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive <coughs> your brother or sister from your heart. Now that story of the parable of the unforgiving servant about the fate of the merciless is really a very frightening parable. It's a bit like the parable of the sheep and the goats. Mm. You know, the, the merciful 
that's the sheep are on one side and the unmerciful nations right, are on the other side. Now, I know some people that have a vision that Australia become a sheep nation. Right? Um, well, I'm not saying this is all that simple. But one thing for sure, Australia is not a sheep nation at the moment. Australia is a goat nation. As people keep, they, you know, governments keep cutting back foreign aid and so on and so on, and, which they do, they keep pruning, I get getting these things all the time, but don't know. Right, here's a goat nation, and it's not about foreign aid. We are a goat nation, if you're thinking of those terms. All right. Well, let's talk about the miracles of Jesus. Now, when we see the, mir the miracles of Jesus, uh, we can look at the outside, which is easier to see, but we can look at the inside as well. So the mercy present in Jesus' miracles was operating at multiple levels. But most importantly, what you see on the outside was a reflection of what was happening on the inside of Jesus. You remember he stood at the tomb of Lazarus and it says in one translation, Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. What's going on here? He literally, this is the sort of background to the Greek, snorts like a war horse going into battle in indignation, anger and agitation at the reality of the evil confronting him. Jesus is completely intolerant of the power of death <coughs> which is holding back the glorious purposes of God for us. Now he will confront death by his own death. And he goes on to do what? Raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, it had to happen. If Jesus was so, so stirred up in the spirit about the evil that was in front of him, you know, and Lazarus was his friend, dead, decomposing. It was a sure thing he was going to be raised from the dead. In other places, when Jesus is moved with compassion to heal, and it's quite common, the word means the movement of the inner parts of a human being, like the intestines. The whole life of Jesus is engaged battling and overcoming the onslaught of evil as he steps forth as a total revelation of the heart of God. Understand? Jesus, inside and outside, not just outside, right? Because th there are false prophets and false miracle workers, but inside and outside, Jesus is the total revelation of the heart of God. So when you see Jesus and you can see what's happening inside of him, you know you see actually the heart of God. In carrying the sorrow of God for the world in himself, Jesus had to keep praying because without that he couldn't have gone on with his ministry. Keep praying. And as Jesus ministered in the mercy of God, his own humanity was being matured. He was growing. He was growing. But something beyond the teaching and miracles of Jesus was needed to completely atone or make satisfaction for human sin and to restore the glory of God to miserable sinners. Now, what I've said there, and I've really said that Jesus has got to go and die to fix things up. And I've said only Jesus' death can restore the glory of God to miserable sinners. Now, why do, don't people use that language today? Like, we're miserable sinners. Because we have to have good self-esteem. We're supposed to have good self-esteem. Well, politically correct. Um, <laughs> I didn't quite catch what Andrew said, but... Self-esteem. Yes. I don't know if that's good. Look, okay. People don't like to talk that way today. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. God the Creator must totally share in human suffering and death to bring mercy to the miserable will cost God everything. And that will be the mercy of the cross. We'll talk about it next week. So I'm at the conclusion, which is slightly longer than the normal problem. 
In Christ, God stepped into a human condition. He did take our nature, as well as being around people. A human condition breaking up under the weight of guilt, shame, and God's own threatening judgment. Human life is always breaking up. Obvious. Despite all empty boasts and technological optimism, we're all subject to an inescapable inner bondage and anxiety about existence and its termination in death. People are in desperate, oh, desperate situations. Some friends of mine have set up a certain um, clinic somewhere and I forget, they charge $10,000 a week or something and I thought that was a lot. It's for wealthy people. Maybe it's 20, I can't remember. But there was some article in the newspaper about one of the Game of, Game of Thrones stars mm -hmm. and he's going in America to a clinic that charges $120,000 a month. And people, because he's an alcoholic and other things, that, man, money can't hit him. <laughs> money can't get rid of your misery. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's just there. And as you get older, the demolition to which we are all subject becomes increasingly unavoidable. Only the limitless mercy of God in Jesus, which is Jesus, the mercy of God as a person, it's Jesus can deliver us. Because in Jesus is a mercy that refused to be defeated and has triumphed for us all. His death and resurrection has triumphed over our stubborn refusal to cry out to God for mercy. Oh, and last week, I commented on how we seem to be lacking the urgency that was there in the pleas for mercy found in the Old Testament. Remember? There were lots of people crying out for mercy in the Old Testament. Lots of examples in the Gospels of people crying out for mercy. But pleas for mercy are also a part of moves of God in the church. Now, I've got something to say here from Martin Luther. Martin Luther spoke to quote, <coughs> of my boundless misery. He spoke of his boundless misery. Now, when he talked about his boundless misery, no one at the time thought he was a depressive or suffering from low self-esteem. He meant that the real tr truth is that outside of Christ, there are no places in human life where a human being is free from the misery and wretchedness of the loss of the glory of God. There is no place in human life, apart from in Christ, where a human being is free from the misery and wretchedness of the loss of the glory of God. You know, do you ever get tired? Do you ever get sick? Do you ever get worn down? Do you ever get anxious? Do you ever get fearful or depressed? Do you ever get jealous? And we could go on and on and on. You know? Oh, many, many examples. People looking for recognition, people looking, you know, it's all falling apart. Now, there's an interesting image that comes from another theologian, Karl Barth. And this is an image which is pretty potent, I think, pretty raw, pretty brutal even. There's no makeover. You know makeover? Yeah? It covers something over. Right? So you can't see what's really there. But this is what he says. And this is, this is not about uh, a disease. Right? It's about sin's effects. He says, I can toss and turn on my sick bed. I can transfer or, transfer or be transferred from one sick bed to another. When it, sickness is particularly severe, I can change hospitals. <coughs> or if I prefer, arrange for private treatment. But I'm always sick. And my sickness is always the same. It is the incurable misery which dominates my life and always emerges in one form or another. Right? Now, the theological people talk about the power of sin, the penalty of sin, and the pollution of sin. The power of sin, you can't escape it. The penalty of sin, that's the wages of sin, is death. And the pollution of sin is it mucks everything up. 
Mm. All right? And you can't escape it. Apart from Jesus, you cannot get it outside of it. People can make over things, you know, and sometimes they do that with like alcohol, drugs, money, you know, sex, whatever, religion. But you're always sick. Apart from Christ. If divine mercy flows to human misery, then we really need an insight into how the Lord sees our present spiritual state. Individually, in the church, and in the nation. Then, when we see things <coughs> as the Lord sees them, we will cry for mercy and the Lord will touch our misery. God's heart wants to touch our hearts through the cross, which is what I'll talk about next week. I believe we only begin to see the limitless nature of God's mercy, which is about the gospel, you see. We only begin to see the limitless nature of God's mercy when we ask the most painful questions. Now, these most painful questions are not questions about ourselves, because we always cover over one way or other. They're questions about Christ's sufferings. Why was there no mercy for Jesus when he died so painfully on the cross? Where is the mercy of the Father when his Son cries out in utter misery, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The mystery of God's mercy is only fully unveiled when we see that when God appears to be a merciless father, you know, when Jesus is dying, when he seems to be no father at all, when even Jesus can't call him father, that he is most fully the mercy our misery needs. Right? Now, there's much more one could say about that. But again, it's about, this is about the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the power of the gospel. So let's keep asking the Lord to reveal to us how he sees our need for mercy and how he has fully answered our need in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, 